Good morning, and welcome to our new normal worship service. Not exactly what we'd like to have, but uh, hey, we're keeping social distancing. We're trying to keep ourselves healthy, and with God's grace and God's spirit, we will indeed be able to worship our Lord and God. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who created the heavens and the earth. Amen. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me shall have life and have it abundantly. For I came to give you new life. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our opening hymn of praise this morning, our opening music of praise this morning will be, brought, will be provided by Sarah and Luke Morris. It's a recording. They're relatives, of course, of the uh, Reed family, and um, we thank them for their participation.
Thank you, Sarah and Luke. Another beautiful rendition of your music, and we do appreciate it. Unfortunately, our behavior, our actions, is not so beautiful as the music we just heard. We disappoint God, we disappoint ourselves, we disappoint our neighbors. We must confess who we are. Please join me in a prayer of confession. Let us pray. Loving God, we know there are times when we feel surrounded by hopelessness and despair, and we do not know where to turn. We feel as if life has left us and those we love, and we find ourselves longing for endings. Yet you, O oh God, come to us even in those times, and especially in those times. You challenge us that you are a God of forgiveness, hope, new life, new beginnings. You invite us to proclaim a message of life in the midst of despair. Receive then our confession and fill us with the breath of new life and forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he should die, will yet live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. There is redemption and newness of life in Christ. This is our faith, and this is our testimony. Believe these words, this good news. Go forth to serve our Lord in peace that we might indeed serve God as he desires. He has given us two rules by which we should live our lives when he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This he suggests is the first and great commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And these two rules are summarized all the law and the prophets. Amen. The Old Testament lesson this morning is taken from the prophecy of Ezekiel, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 37. Hear these words. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones in the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then the Lord said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come over you and cover your skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. And they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. This is the first lesson.
Thank you, Joe, for that uh, message from the choir. I assume I was in that too, but I don't know. I haven't seen it yet. Anyway, welcome back. Our New Testament lesson today is taken from the 11th chapter of John, beginning with the first verse. Hear these words. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the Lord's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, A short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, And the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. 
the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Here ends the readings. May God open our hearts and minds to the message. This is the time when we typically have our children's message, and that will be forthcoming in a minute. Um, Joe Reed has got another message for the children. But I also want to encourage the children to go to the church's website. That's beverlypresbyterianchurch.org. And there you will find um, a couple spots where you can pull up a children's bulletin, which is related to the text, which I just read. So I encourage you to go to the church website and look for that, those bulletin connections, or links, rather, and um, print them out and fill them out. And if you want to, send them to me to show me that you've done some work. It'll help you uh, appreciate better the passage, which I just read. Anyway. Hey, kids. Welcome to another episode of Backyard Bible. I'm Joe. How you doing today? Oh, you want to know why I'm wearing a hat? That's to remind me of something I wanted to talk to you about. Have you ever really, really wanted something really bad, and then you asked your parents, and your parents said no? I mean, you really, 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 really wanted something really bad, and your parents said no. Well, my kids, when they were young, they wanted a pony, a hat. And when I was young, I wanted a pony, too. And so they came to me and I had to say no. I didn't want to, but I had to. Why? Well, because as an adult, I know that ponies need a lot. They need a big yard. And while my yard is pretty big, it's not big enough for a pony. They need a place to live. Well, my kids said they could live in my workshop here. It's too small for a pony. And that pony would be very, very sad. And they also need a lot of grass. And I just don't have enough grass to feed a pony. So I know that a pony is not a good idea, and I had to tell my kids that, and they were disappointed. Well, sometimes when an adult has a lot of information, they're a little older, and they just know things that you don't know, they're going to say no. Well, there are times when we all want things, and we ask God for them, and occasionally God's going to say no too. It's not that he doesn't love us, it's just that he's all-knowing, and he has information that we just don't have. And he knows it's not the best idea for us. So we have to trust him, just like we have to trust our parents to make good decisions and help us to do the things we want to do. That doesn't mean that you can never have a pony, but what it means is that maybe you can't have a pony right now. And so it's important to realize that as we ask for things, occasionally the answer is going to be no. And that's not a bad thing. It's actually kind of a good thing. So in the future, when you ask for something, just be aware that Again, it doesn't mean that you can't have it. It just means maybe the answer is right now for no. And in the future, perhaps you'll have a bigger yard. Or maybe when you grow up, you'll buy a farm and you'll have lots of ponies. That's it for, uh, for today. Let's say a little prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for all the things you do for us, keeping us safe and guiding us to do the right thing and to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again. That's uh, it for Bi Backyard Bible. See you next time. Will you join me in the spirit of prayer? Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and may the thoughts, the meditations, and the reflections of this year congregation Find acceptance and pleasure in your sight, who are our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Our Reformation fathers recognized that when words are set to music, it dramatically increases one's ability to remember them. Hence, Martin Luther gave us a mighty fortress is our God, which you heard earlier in our recording this morning. And John Calvin is credited with the hymn, I greet thee whom I sure redeemer art. Now I suppose that a class in human anatomy could benefit from the words to the song, Dem Dry Bones, though arranger James Weldon Johnson didn't intend them to be used in that manner, at least primarily. They were composed rather to give heart and courage to those, especially 
Afro-Americans who felt down and dispirited. Indeed, the inspiration for these words was given to the prophet Ezekiel at a most difficult and trying time for the children of Israel. Moses had guided them out of the land of Egypt. Joshua had helped them to conquer the promised land. And there they enjoyed their own kingdom and way of life for several centuries. But then King Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian hordes took the Jews captive in the year 586 BC and transported them to Babylon in years of prolonged exile. The life and culture of the Jews dissipated and crumbled. It was there and then that Ezekiel is accorded this vision of them dry bones. By the Spirit of the Lord, Ezekiel writes, I was set down in the midst of a valley. It was full of bones. Now, it's unknown exactly what Ezekiel may have seen, but it's entirely possible that these were the bones of an army that had been trapped in this valley by hostile forces and had been summarily slaughtered. The flesh had long ago deteriorated and fallen away. Now there was nothing left but a pile of bones baking in the sun. In the prophet's words, they were very dry. Still in Ezekiel's mind, there can be no doubt that he imagined these bones as the remnants of the life and land and culture of Judah and the land and people from which he had been exiled. King Nebuchadnezzar had not been kind. And Ezekiel's people had fallen to his mighty army and now found themselves a thousand miles from their homeland, having been paraded there in disgrace. It was not a pleasant picture. Amidst this scene of death, decay, and destruction, the Lord poses a powerful question to Ezekiel. Son of man, the Lord addresses the prophet in a manner typical of his original call of Ezekiel. Son of man, he said, can these bones live? Well, some might interpret the question as taunting, hitting a man while he was hurt, hitting him beneath the belt. And yet it is a very real question. An all-too-real question. For example, a young man in a wheelchair, crippled by an accident, asks a friend, do I have a future? A couple sits in the counselor's office wondering, can our marriage be saved? A widow sinks low into a chair. Only a few hours earlier, they had lowered into the ground the casket containing her beloved husband. How can I go on, she wonders, as she softly cries in despair. Church members fail to gather for worship in a, in a church because a virus is necessitating social distancing. And they ask, how long, O oh Lord, how long before life can return to some semblance of normal? Son of man, can these bones live? Can that which is dead be restored to life? Can a situation that has been written off as hopeless be recouped, revived, resurrected? Is there any hope? Many, many people have lived in the valley of them dry bones. And that's even apart from the way many of us might be feeling today. Charles Plum, in his book entitled, I'm No Hero, talked about being in that valley. During the Vietnam War, Plum was a fighter pilot. One day, his plane was hit. As it fell toward the earth, it turned upside down, threatening to trap him inside. He managed to right the plane enough so that he could eject. But he landed in enemy territory and was quickly captured. For the next six years, his home was an eight-by-eight cell with a dirt floor and a tin can for a toilet. To make matters even worse, Plum's captors frequently tortured him by twisting his body with ropes. They would twist my body, he said, and I would think, I can take this much, but I know I couldn't take any more. And then they would twist me tighter, unquote. Often he would be thrown back into his cell with torn muscles, 
and he'd tell himself, well, I lived through that. I know I couldn't take any more. Yet somehow, some way, he survived each instance of torture. One day, Charles saw a wire appear beneath the bamboo wall of his cell and wiggle as if offering him a signal. He watched the wire for several days before he mustered enough courage to pull on it. When he did, he discovered that it came from another prisoner. Using the wire to signal letters of the alphabet, he began to ask questions. Charles discovered that 200 other men were being brutalized just as he was. When he was finally freed, Charles was flown to San Francisco, where he tried to call his wife, but he couldn't locate her. Then he telephoned his father, who told him that his wife had left him. Come on home, son, said the father. It's a new day. Let's start afresh. But after all he'd been through, was a new start even possible? For a while. Charles thought not. Could them dry bones live again? Mary and Martha found themselves in that valley when their brother Lazarus died. They had sent for Jesus as soon as Lazarus had been ill, but Jesus had delayed his coming. By the time he arrived, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. When she saw Jesus, Mary bared a heart, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would have lived and not died. Then she began to weep. Perhaps touched by Mary's tears, or simply as an expression of his own personal grief, Jesus wept. For days, Mary and Martha had been living in the Valley of Dry Bones. Many of you, if not all of us, have been there as well. Certainly all of us will be in that valley of them dry bones at some time in our lives. Indeed, some may very well feel we're living in just such a time these very days. There in that lonesome valley, we'll find ourselves asking, is there any hope? Can I go on? Can these bones live again? The answer is a resounding Yes, there is hope. You can go on. These bones can live again. The question then is, how? How can we find hope in the midst of desolation? Courage in the face of impending collapse. Comfort in our hour of ultimate distress. Boon in the hour of doom. The answer by the word of the Lord. And the Lord said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, you know. And again the Lord said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Remember that in the creation God spoke. Simple words. Let there be light. And there was light. Such was the power of God's word. It was by the word of the Lord that God revealed the fullness of his divine love for humanity, with the gospel of John expressing it thus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it was by a word that Christ Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead. Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man did come out, his hands and feet still bound with bandages, and his face wrapped with a cloth. It is by the word of the Lord that we live and we move and we have our being. Our hope and our help is in the word of the Lord. That is why the words of the Bible, the scriptures, are so important to our lives. And I say that realizing that there are many who rarely, or certainly all too infrequently, open or read the Bible. It's a bit humorous, but perhaps you've heard the story of the bandit who had been badly injured and was taken to a Christian mission hospital. As a result of weeks of excellent care, the bandit made a full recovery. He was so grateful for the treatment that he had received that he resolved he would never again rob a Christian. 
Well, that word got around. And everyone he tried to hold up and rob would immediately say, but I'm a Christian. Now, obviously, this was bad for the man's business. So the man that went back to the hospital and asked the missionaries how he could distinguish who really was and was not Christian. And they responded, every Christian should know the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments. From that point on, the bandit would tell his intended victims to recite the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments. And if they could not, then it would proceed to rob them. Now let me pose a question. How would you fare on just such a quiz? Many persons are practically illiterate when it comes to the scriptures. And thus we miss a tremendous sort of comfort, source rather, of comfort and strength. Writer Catherine Mansfield died prematurely in 1923 of tuberculosis. She discovered the Bible in her mature life never having read it or studied it until then. I feel so bitterly, she wrote in her journal, that I have never known these writings before. They ought to be part of my very breathing. And that's true for all of us. Particularly when we are in the valley of them dry bones, we need the written word of the Lord. That is why the scriptures are important, indeed vital, to our lives. That also is why worship is important to our lives. In worship, we discover the word of the Lord for our lives. Some years ago, a speedboat driver was near top speed when his boat veered slightly and hit a wave at a precipitous angle. The combined force of his speed and the size and angle of the wave sent the boat spinning dangerously in the air. He was thrown from his seat and propelled deep into the water, so deep, in fact, that he had no idea which direction was up. He had to remind himself to remain calm and wait for the buoyancy of his life vest to begin pulling him up. Once he discovered which way was up, he could swim for the surface. Worship is that time of the week when we wait calmly so that we can rediscover which way is up. That is particularly important when we are mired in the valley. In his book, Believe and Belong, author Bruce Larson uses an analogy about the gigantic statue of Atlas at the entrance of the RCA building on Fifth Avenue in New York City. Here you have Atlas, this beautifully proportioned man who, with all his muscles straining, holds the world upon his shoulders. Even though he is the most powerfully built man on earth, still he can barely stand up under this burden. Now that's one way to live, Larson suggests, trying to carry the world on your shoulders. Now on the other side of Fifth Avenue, Larson notes is St. Patrick's Cathedral. Inside, behind the high altar, is a little shrine of the boy Jesus. He's perhaps eight or nine years old, and with no effort, he is holding the world in a single hand. We have a choice, suggests Larson. We can carry the world on our shoulders, or we can say, I give up, Lord. Here's my life. I give you my world, the whole world. For many of us, this hour of worship is that time of the week when we shift our burden from our shoulders unto the Lord. We find our strength, our help in the name and in the word of the Lord. That is why the scriptures are so important to us. And that is why worship is important to us. Finally, too, that is why prayer is so important to us. When you are in a valley of dry bones, you discover that prayer is more than a mere ritual at mealtime or before retiring. A pastor happened to be visiting the home of one of his parishioners. A small boy in the home started reaching for the potatoes before the blessing was pronounced. His mother gently scolded him. 
The boy was confused. Why were they seated at the table except to eat? As the adults bowed their heads to say grace, the child suddenly caught on. As his father started to pray, the boy shouted, Hey, Dad, could I be the one that talks to the plate this time? Now, some people might just as easily be talking to their plates. Their prayers have so little forethought or passion. Such is not the case for those who have been in the valley of dumb dry bones. In the darkness of the valley, we've reached out and felt an unseen hand. When Norris Dam was built in the mid-30s in the hills of eastern Tennessee, a worker in the night shift noticed how strange it was to hear the great dynamos humming during the calm of the night and then to look across the lake and see cabins lit with kerosene lamps. When he asked why this was, he was informed that the transmission lines had not been laid there yet. Even though these folks lived in the shadow of this great hydroelectric dam, they could not receive its power because there were no lines connecting the dam to their homes. And so it is with many people. They have no link. No connection with the one who can restore a new life to them dry bones. Prayer provides that link. Can dry bones live again? Indeed. There is hope even in the midst of the valley of them dry bones. For God is a living God a God who is faithful to his promises and is powerful enough to accomplish whatever he wills. Hear the words from Ezekiel's vision as it moves toward a climax. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. Behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. That, of course, is the origin of the spiritual's refrain. The shin bones connected to the knee bone, knee bones connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bones connected to the hip bone. So hear the word of the Lord. Well, the climax for Ezekiel comes in verse 10. So I prophesied as the Lord commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived. I believe in the resurrection of the body, we regularly confess in the words of the Apostles' Creed. That is an inspirational and exciting piece of news for us. There is hope. There's hope in the word, in worship, and in prayer. Even them dry bones, our aching bones and spirits can live again. Let us pray. Lord God, we come to you and we we know about the valley filled with dim dry bones. We've been there. And yet we know, God, we can find hope in the midst of desolation, courage in the face of impending collapse, Comfort in our hour of ultimate distress. Boon in the hour of our doom. And that's why the scriptures are so important. Indeed vital to our lives. That is why worship is so important to our lives. And that is why prayer is important to our lives. Keep us linked with you, O God. And hear our prayers, we pray. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I share with you a few announcements at this time. Um, First of all, and this is important, it's critical for the life of this church and critical for many lives of many institutions in these days. It's important to mail in your tithes, offerings, and contributions. This church will continue to have bills. I walked into the sanctuary this morning, and it was a little bit warmer than outside in the hallway because Sherry had turned up the heat. 
we needed a little bit of heat in here because these walls can get pretty cold in this in this uh, cool world we live in. But anyway, remember to send in your gifts, tithes, and offerings, and send them to P.O. Box 500, not the street address, P.O. Box 500 in Beverly, New Jersey, 08010-0500. Also, as you've probably heard, um, the Red Cross is having a severe shortage of blood, and we had a blood drive scheduled here for the church on April 8th. That blood drive will still be held, so please plan to be here uh, on the 8th of April. You can join me on one of the tables, so hopefully I'll be giving platelets again this time. Anyway, then too, um, the newsletter has been worked on and published, put out by Karen. I know she had to do a, a, a good portion of it the second time, and thank you for your efforts, Karen. It is appreciated, and uh, thanks to Sherry, who uh, then runs that and uh, assembles it, and that should be in the mail within the next couple days, so look for that in your mail. And then also, a special word of thanks to Joe for his work in enabling this to be broadcast, and to Scott um, for the, his music, also to Sarah and Luke, the choir for their encore performance, and... Uh, for all those who are continuing to make the life and ministry of this church possible and ongoing, we thank you. And I know God does too. As I indicated, this church still needs tithes and offerings. So at this time, your tithes and offerings will be received and the choir will be singing in the background. We don't have a choir. Anyway, please remember your gifts, tithes, and offerings. Let us then be joined together in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know that the Sabbath day is only one in seven, and that makes it different. But this Sabbath day, O oh God, is especially different. We gather virtually by means of technology and how wonderful, even miraculous it is that in this time when we must maintain social distancing for our own health and welfare, we are still able to be in touch with one another. We thank you for the gift of modern technology and we thank you for those like Joe who make it possible for us to share your words, O oh God, with your people, your flock. Thank you. We pray, O oh God, for our world, for people around this globe are suffering. They're living in fear. Fear of a tiny virus which is Oh, so powerful. God, we're, there are many people who fear not having enough. And we remember, too, for those people who fear not having anything at all. We feel stripped, ill-equipped sometimes to feel the challenges we're facing these days, oh God. And yet we still have something. We have much more than so much of the world. We ask your blessing upon us, but we ask your blessing especially upon those internationally who will not have enough to survive. Comfort them, we pray. And in some way, we pray you'll be able to help sustain them. We thank you for the special efforts of those who keep us going in these days. We thank you for teachers who are learning to teach virtually in classrooms with no students, but by technology, their learnings can be brought to children. 
We thank you for the many health care professionals who risk their lives so that others might enjoy life more comfortably, more fully, and even be healed. Lord, again, these are such trying times. And we pray that we might meet the challenges placed upon us by them. Grace us with your Holy Spirit. Inspire us by your Spirit. Uplift us so that our dry bones and the many other dry bones can hear the word of the Lord and see the impact it has on us and upon others. Continue to grace us, O God. Grace this Beverly Presbyterian Church. Grace your Christians in this nation and around the world. And grace all nations here on earth, for we need you. We need you every hour, but particularly in this hour, God. Be with us, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' holy name. For we know that he prayed, and he taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As our hymn of departure, we have some special music. It's a tune or hymn composed by Scott Reed entitled, Three Nails and a Cross. Three Nails and a Cross. laid out before me He bore the stripes that would set me free And they lifted high for the sins of the lost He suffered and died on three nails and a cross loved us. He has bridged the divide with three nails and a cross. Three nails and a cross for the vanquished and lost. Three nails and a cross just for me. Such a staggering cost Three nails and a cross Just for me He could have chosen the clouds Or the depths of the sea But he humbled himself And now he's living in me He built his temple in morning renews it with the love that I see in three nails and a cross three nails and a cross for the vanquished and lost three nails and
such a staggering cost Three emails and a cross just for me Three emails and a cross For the vanquished and lost Three emails and a cross just for me Three emails and such a staggering cost Three emails and a cross Just for me Three emails and a cross Just for me South Korean Christians are also suffering with the um, coronavirus, and I picked this up from the internet. The senior pastor of one church asked members to practice 113, somewhat like our 911 here in the United States. And he has the one is in one day, call one person to check up on them and encourage them. And then Pray for three people. One, one, three. I think that's good advice, good counsel for all of us, especially in this time, to reach out, to touch others with a word of grace, a word of welcome, a word of care in this age of social isolation. May you be graced, and may indeed you be graceful unto others. For God is with us. His word still comforts us. It came to Ezekiel. It came to Jesus. It has come to apostles and Christians throughout the years. And it will come to us again today. So go. And may the blessings of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be in abide with you today and always. Amen.